it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you today? Great! Well, we have a full day of things to do today. First, I want to swing by the post office. I need to mail out all the Patreon rewards. Thank you, Patreons. I'm sorry it's taken a little longer this month than usual, but everything is going out today. And we are doing a uh, special sunglass vlog today, and it's going to be a special one because we are going to one of the good guys of Hollywood's house. We are going to a man who gave us many of the TV shows from the 50s, 60s, and 70s that would help uh, mold people's lives. And like I said, he was one of the good guys. So today, we're going to go honor and check out the house of the great Danny Thomas. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Well, Barbara Dodson, here are your sunglasses, and this is your vlog. I hope you enjoy it. Now let's hit the road. Okay, we're heading off to the dreaded Hollywood post office. When I say there's no way it can be easy, I just mean I can't go to the machines. I can't do the machines today. There's just no way. And usually they're understaffed here, so there's almost always a line. You guys are going to love when we get to Danny's house, not only what it looks like, but who his neighbor was. That would have been Ciro's in Danny's day. Dig the eyeball theme over here. They're everywhere. Well, here's our turn. Hillcrest. Now, if you ever want to come find Danny Thomas's house on your own, you literally just take this to the dead end of Hillcrest where it becomes a cul-de-sac. See, no outlet. Well, my friends, here we are. Former state of Danny Thomas. That was not his birth name, but it's amazing to see this beautiful, lavish property and to know that a young kid born to Lebanese immigrants who weren't very wealthy, they were, he was one of nine children, would someday grow up to live in a palatial estate looking like this. Danny's original name is a name I can't even pronounce, and he wasn't a great student. In fact, he ditched school a lot because he said that he, um, he missed his brothers. He loved his brothers so much that when he was at school, he just couldn't concentrate. He always wanted to be with his family. And eventually he would go by the name of Amos Jacobs as a performer, but then later settled on Danny Thomas. Now, how did he become Danny Thomas? Well, it was because of his brothers. He said that he used to love to doodle his brother's names on his papers and uh, decided to choose his first brother, well, his youngest and his oldest brother, Danny and Thomas, and that became his professional name of Danny Thomas. Danny Thomas credited quite a bit of his success in life to his faith. He started out as a $2 a night nightclub comic and his wife started to think maybe this wasn't the right career for him. He wasn't making enough money and they had a baby on the way. And so one day he went to Catholic Mass on Sunday morning and he normally would put a dollar in the offering. And he said, this week, this particular Sunday that I came, the preacher was so good. I mean, he deserved way, way more. And all I had was $7 to my name and I threw it in the offering. And before I'd realized what I had done, and walked away, he said, I, I, it dawned on me, oh my gosh, my wife's gonna have a baby this week, I'm gonna need that money back sevenfold. And he said, I just looked up to the sky and prayed to St. Jude that I would get that money. And um, he said in those days, St. Jude was not a popular saint to pray to, it was the patron saint of hopelessness. And um, he said he prayed to get that money somehow the next day he got offered a job um, doing a broadcast and the sponsors called him and said that he would be paid $75. Um, this was on Monday, this was the very next day after he had um, put that in the offering. And then he was to film that Wednesday. They said, you'll be paid on Friday. He was paid on that Friday. And on Sunday, Marlo was born <laughs> in the hospital. 
He said uh, he made $75 and her birth costed $74.36. Now, a lot of Danny's success, he would credit to be um, coming from his neighborhood. He said it was actually the fact that his neighborhood was such a melting pot of Polish people, Italians, uh, Irish, just running the gamut Lebanese. And he said because of that, he was able to pick up different accents and that would kind of become his humor. How about that? He was able to turn his early childhood, almost poverty type uh, childhood into something that would afford him this home. Now Danny experimented in all types of performance and media in those days. Like I said, he was a nightclub performer and he also performed on radio saying that one of his earliest jobs being paid on radio was uh, actually making the sound effect for uh, the Lone Ranger's horse. <laughs> he said he would do the galloping sound with a plunger and he, uh, he would also venture into movies and he said when he first got an offer to come make movies it was Louis B. Mayer who said, you know, you have a lot of charisma, you could be maybe another Cary Grant, but with that nose, he said, you, you, you know, people that watch movies want a fairy tale and you break the fairy tale because the people in the audience have the flaws, not the people on the screen. You need to take care of that nose. And Danny said, well, the difference between their flaws and mine is I breathe out of mine and it's right in the middle of my face. <laughs> so he said, he and his agent talked and they said, you know, what should we do? You know, Danny said, basically, I just, I, I want to be able to go home and visit my family and look like my brothers and sister. And um, so his agent said, you know what, forget them. And to his credit, Danny would make it in movies anyway, and then be offered television. A form of entertainment at the time that a lot of people that had done movies felt to be somewhat shameful to do. Danny would go on to do Make Room for Daddy, become a major success. He would be the producer of that, and it would run for 11 seasons. Now, like I said, Danny credited a lot of his success to his faith, and what I mean by that is not only him getting that money when Marlo was born, but he said, at a time in his life where I didn't really know what to do, he said, one day I just threw myself on the mercy of St. Jude and I said, give me some guidance. Show me what I'm supposed to do and if you do, I will build a shrine in your honor. And so when Danny had all the success with his career, he would in fact make good and would spend 40 years of his life raising money and starting the St. Jude's Children's Hospital for research and treatment. Now, Danny Thomas deserves a lot of credit, not only for being a funny man, which he was, and being a good guy, which he was, and his show, Make Room for Daddy, would have him portraying a nightclub performer, living with a family and showing his daily family life, almost a reverse of I Love Lucy. And um, with that success, he would also use his talents to make other people a household name. That's right, Danny Thomas would go on to produce many famous shows, starting with coming up with the first spinoff, or at least they say he was credited as coming up with the first spinoff. He had hired a, well, semi-known comedian working his way up the ranks to portray a kind of backwoods, hillbilly hick sheriff. That man was Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith was cast to just do a little bit part with the Danny Thomas uh, television show, and before the show was even filmed that day, the sponsors liked Andy Griffith so much that they decided, hey, he, this guy's a star in the making. Danny Thomas then went to Andy and said, we're gonna give you your own show, and it became the Andy Griffith Show. So while I'm talking, take a look at all the details of the house, the mailbox, and uh, the light fixtures and everything. It's quite magnificent. So Danny not only was responsible for the Andy Griffith Show, but he would also be responsible for bring to life the Dick Van Dyke show. He was the producer of that. He also did his own show, The Danny Thomas Show, Make Room for Daddy. He did Gomer Pyle. He did The Real McCoys. And later on, he would pair up with Aaron Spelling to do The Mod Squad. So he was definitely quite important in the forming of our pop culture. But like I said, that wasn't enough. He had made a promise. And so, he started raising money to start 
St. Jude's Children's Hospital, which he said the mission there would be no child that couldn't afford treatment would ever be turned away. And in 1962 in Memphis, Tennessee, the doors were opened and research and treatment began. Um, the reason it was started in Memphis was actually because uh, Danny had a lot of religious figures that he looked up to in his life and when he decided to do this he said where he went to them and said where would be the best place to to open this that would be most effective and they told him Memphis Tennessee which is a place that became so near and dear to Danny's heart that he and his wife would both eventually be buried there. Now Danny's children also became somewhat well known as well. His first daughter, Marlo, would star in That Girl, and she would, right behind these gates on this property, be married to television talk show host Phil Donahue. He also had a son named Tony Thomas. Now, what's kind of cool about the Tony Thomas story is that Tony also became a producer, and Tony went on to produce a couple of my favorite shows, one being The Golden Girls and the other being Empty Nest, which his father, Danny Thomas, would make a cameo on uh, before he passed away. And what's kind of cool about that is where they filmed The Golden Girls and Empty Nest was on the same exact lot that Danny Thomas filmed his shows, both the ones that he starred in and the ones that he produced for other people. So when he went back to work on that Empty Nest episode, he was able to get to relive the moments on those same stages that he would have watched The Real McCoys and Andy Griffith Show being taped and where he would have done Make Room for Daddy and Danny Thomas Show. Now when St. Jude's began, there was no other facility quite like this. And in fact, at the time, children's uh, successful treatment rate in that time of the 1960s was about 20%. Um, at the time of Danny's death and past, it was up in the mid 80s. So you can tell that the, all the research and the time and the money and everything that's been spent has, has been a godsend to all of those families that have been helped. And uh, thanks to Danny Thomas and his um, commitment to giving back to what he thought gave him his success. Now I mentioned that Danny Thomas chose to open the St. Jude's Children's Center in Memphis, Tennessee. And there's a pretty famous person that we all know from Memphis, Tennessee named Elvis Presley. He also used to contribute to that cause. And maybe one of the reasons that he did it beyond being just a good guy was that he also lived right here next door to Danny Thomas. That's right, Elvis was Danny's next door neighbor. So if this was Danny Thomas's estate, Elvis's estate is the one right there. You can see hiding behind those trees. And I have vlogged that in the past. That was the Hillcrest estate. Danny Thomas was considered Hollywood comedy royalty. He was a member of the Friars Club. He did all those roasts and his best friends were people like Bob Hope, Milton Berle, Groucho Marx. And what a life he led. What a legacy he left behind. St. Jude's Children's Hospital is still making research and development its priority and still helping people all over the world. Danny Thomas's death came as a shock to everyone that knew him. He was in good health and people that saw him just weeks before said he was fine. He passed away of a heart attack at the age of 79 in 1991. And if you'd ever like to go visit his grave, as I said, he and his beloved Rosemary are both buried on the grounds of St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And to her credit, his wife Rosemary continued to work for that cause, raise money, and to be a driving force in St. Jude's until her death in the early 2000s. What a beautiful property. I saw online that it's been for sale for quite a bit and uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to haul out here and, and do this vlog now is that Scott Michaels told me he had heard a rumor or maybe that it's, it's a true rumor that they're going to, uh, they're supposedly going to tear this down. I don't know if it's been sold or what the circumstances beyond that decision are but for a man that gave so much to Hollywood and all of our lives, I'm sure even if you didn't watch him or even maybe even know his name, you knew Andy Griffith show, you knew Gomer Pyle, you knew Dick Van Dyke show. Thought he was worth remembering here.
And I'll briefly show you the Elvis house since we're here. If you want to see more of it, you can go watch the uh, vlog I did on it. Here's the front door. You can see people always write little notes to them and things here. But here's the house. Now it's an Airbnb, I believe. That's the famous driveway. You can find countless photos of Elvis uh, taking photos with fans at this same exact gate and driving his motorcycle out this driveway. All right, gang, so that was excellent timing. Just as I was up there crawling around looking at Elvis's house, uh, somebody actually drove into the Danny Thomas estate and I started talking to him and it was actually somebody from a construction company and I told him what I was out here doing, just you know, documenting Danny's life and showing the house. And uh, I said, do you know if the house has been sold or if it's still uh, owned by the Thomas family? And he said, it actually has been sold recently. And I said, well, I'd heard that they were thinking of tearing it down. Do you know anything about that? And he said, I don't actually know um, right as of now what they're going to do but he gave me his number and he said give me a call this week and um, if if I can get you in here and get you you know if they're gonna tear it down or anything he said and I can help you out I'll, uh, I'll get you in here and maybe talk to the owner and um, let you document it before it's changed um, so he said it's probably you know sometime this month he should be able to have an answer for me so kind of cool we might be able to uh, get in there and look around at some point so they're actually rebuilding two entire houses on this little street that Elvis and Danny Thomas lived on. And there's almost no parking on the entire street. And I was just, uh, as I was driving up here, I was thinking to myself, I'll bet the neighbors up here in these million dollar homes just love this every single day. So I'll show you this real quick. Hope Amy won't be uh, too upset with me sharing her story, but this is Ringo's house. You can see the uh, the gate has stars and that kind of stuff all over it. But Amy was telling me on this weekend trip that we took that um, she once had dinner with uh, Ringo Starr and his wife and Joe Walsh and his wife and said that Joe Walsh doesn't talk that much and she said that nobody calls Ringo Ringo. They all call him Richie. I had never heard that before. She said all of his friends call him Richie. But look at the gate, all those stars on there. There's the Chateau Marmont to the left. The big white one. Yeah, Amy said when she uh, when she met Ringo, the dinner, his place setting even said Richie instead of Ringo. You didn't eat any of your cheese, any of your eggs, you didn't eat anything while I was gone. Then when I came in and said hi to you, you started snorting and scowling at me. Didn't you? How's the inside of your leg taste? I walked in, you were eating the inside of your leg. Huh? How's your tail taste? I did get some mail. I'm pretty sure I know what this is because I ordered about three or four shirts and two of them came yesterday. I got a really awesome Gene Simmons shirt that I wore yesterday. I hope this is the Bourdain shirt I ordered. It's either going to be Bourdain or the Grateful Dead shirt. Yeah, I absolutely had to get this. I needed a new Grateful Dead shirt and this was just too classic. A skeleton hitchhiking on the road again 1980 that was the other reason I was like I gotta have a shirt that says on the road again since I woke up later today than I wanted to by about an hour John didn't get to go to the park so he's going now that's old school There was just a dog fight. He wasn't involved, but everybody was freaking out. Mainly dog owners not watching their dog, so craziness. That rarely happens here. So one of my friends told me that the Chicago Cubs wore a uh, Brody Stevens t-shirt out on the field the other day. Brody was really good friends with the uh, one of the pitching coaches, or one of the catching coaches, Mike Borzello. He used to be with the Yankees, and then he was with the Dodgers, and then he was with the Cubs, still is with the Cubs. And any of those places that he went, he would always invite Brody to come and go on the road with them and things like that to like cheer people up, because he was a comedian. And uh, when the Cubs finally broke that, a uh, hundred year long streak of not winning a World Series and uh, and they won they invited Brody to ride the float so he was actually in the victory parade float and everything and 
since he uh, unfortunately took his own life a couple of weeks ago. Um, they wanted to honor him, you know, I don't know if it's one last time or at least one more time um, out on the field, which is kind of cool. It's a Brody 818 positive push shirt. Well, he found a friend. I thought he'd have all kinds of energy, but there's just not been much playing going on. A lot of uh, going up and sniffing dogs' noses, but that's about it. Now these two, on the other hand, are playing quite a bit. All right, that was kind of a pointless trip, but we tried. We're out of here. There's the eyeball again. All righty. Good night, everyone. We will see you all tomorrow. Barbara Dodson, I hope you enjoyed your vlog today, and I hope you're a Danny Thomas fan, so I'll be sending those sunglasses out as soon as I can. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you all tomorrow. Good night.